to know how you would define the word freedom. What, what does freedom look like for you? What's included in freedom? How do you know when you're free? What does freedom look like? I instantly picture uh, the way my living condition is right now, just being able to just freely walk through the room, walk through the house, do a cartwheel if I want to, a little front model of mine if I need to do. Just the whole house just is my domain. I, that's that's what I first pictured. So you've got your area, you can do whatever you want in that spot. That's freedom. Okay? You can clean it up if you want to, you can leave it a mess if you want to. <laughs> How would you define freedom? Being able to think, do, say whatever we want without having to ask anybody's permission. No restrictions, no, no conditions, no requirements, no prerequisites. Okay. So being able just to not having somebody looking over your shoulder and, and giving you those boundaries that you got to live within. Mm -hmm. Being able to set those mm -hmm. yourself. When you're talking about uh, uh, military aspect, the sentence always comes up, freedom is not free. Okay. When you're talking about a group of people uh, trying to gain their freedom, they didn't get it for free. Some, there was some cost involved, yeah. and usually it was in personnel's lives, mm -hmm. military lives. So freedom always has a cost. So being able to, to get rid of whatever shackles, whatever <clears throat> imprisonment there is, whatever slavery there is, there's always the, uh, the cost that it takes to get rid of that. See, freedom is a huge word because it's one that everybody wants. Everybody wants to be able to be free. And yet, do we really understand what freedom entails? What freedom looks like? I mean, you think about, um, there are those out there that they have been members of a church somewhere. And then they break away from that church and they decide, well, I'm just, I just don't believe in God anymore and I'm not bound to that system anymore. Look at how free I am because I'm not bound by that church system anymore. Not realizing that even in that freedom, they've really given themselves to something else. <laughs> or the individual who breaks away from a church and they become a part of a cult somewhere. And they said, the reason why I'm so thankful to be a part of this cult because it's so freeing. It provides such liberty for me. Not realizing that they exchanged one set of obligations for another set. What does it look like to truly be free? Because when we open up uh, 2 Peter chapter two, uh, 2 today, and we finish the rest of this chapter, we're going to be looking at a group of folks that uh, they've been offering freedom to folks, but it's a false freedom. It's a freedom that really is not free at all, is what Peter will say. And just to bring us up to date on where we've been here, um, we've been talking about these counterfeit teachers, these false teachers that are showing up in Peter's day and are preying on those who are, Peter says, those who are unstable in their faith. Uh, it could be those that either the, the false teachers have been able to shake their faith to the point where it's just not as strong and firmly grounded as it used to be. Could be new converts, new fo folks to their faith. And they just don't have that foundation and don't have those roots that go down deep. And so these false teachers are able to come in and able to shake their worlds up and, and give them a bunch of teaching that, that's not true. And he said several things about them that we noticed over the last two or three weeks. He's talked about these counterfeit teachers as being individuals whose their method message is false. These are folks that have made up their own stories about Jesus. 
They made up their own stories about angels. They made up their own stories about uh, what God wants. And they peddled these with folks that are ready to listen to them, ready to soak them in and say, man, that sounds so good. That sounds so great. And they give themselves to those instead of giving themselves to the truth that Peter has been giving. He also says about this, this group that their lifestyles are false. That their lifestyles are those that he calls them, that they live in shameful ways. That their depravity, their passions have taken over their lives. Their, their greed has taken over their lives. And they do that using pre-religious words. Well, you know, God just wants us to be happy. God wants us to, to get all of our fill and be able to, to be fulfilled in this life. And so they, they make it sound very appealing and, and very, uh, very godly because they know how to use religious language in order to satisfy their own desires and their own purposes. And then he says their methods are false. That because they are given to such greed that they exploit believers. They exploit Christians in order to gain for themselves what they want. They're not there to give themselves to others. They're there to see what they can get. And they exploit folks. Then last week, we noticed that the main issue with these folks was they were living with this arrogance and this pride about them. And so he says about them that they are revilers. They don't care about authority. They don't care about um, uh, the, the, the systems of authority that God has put together, whether that's government authority or church authority or divine authority or anything like that. In fact, they make up stories about angels and they peddle those things and without any idea, without any uh, consideration for God's order of things. They revile those things. They show contempt for what God has put together. And then he says, because of that, they become revelers. Again, giving their lives to those, those passions and those sinful desires that he says, what it winds up doing is it gives the church a bad reputation. It's those folks who would say, well, it's just a bunch of hypocrites down there. Because they say one thing, but then they live like something else. Or they do things Remember, he talks about how they're those that do these things in broad daylight. They have no shame about them anymore. They do things that even non-Christians wouldn't even dream of doing, that they do it in the name of their faith. And then he says they're revolters, that they have completely rebelled against God and God's purposes for them in order to accomplish their own purposes. And he has said about these folks over and over again, these are individuals that their destruction is sure, their judgment is sure, God is going to, to um, take care of this problem at some point. Don't get wrapped up in their message so that you get swept away with them. And so if we finish up chapter two, the thing that he wants to focus on is how as they're giving these, this message, this false message, really what they're giving is false hope, false freedoms, false promises. They're talking about freedom, but they're talking about the way that really there's no freedom at all. Now, notice what he says, 2 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 17. These people, talking about the false teachers, those who were not bringing truth to them, these people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. For their mouth, for, for they mouth empty, boastful words. And by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. They give a false freedom. He uses some pretty strong language here, doesn't he? He says it's based on these false promises. He talks about they are um, springs without water, mists driven by the storm, blackest darkness is reserved for them. What are you talking about? He talks about springs without water, mists driven by a storm.
I know it's, you didn't have to do this except for whenever you were in English class and you had to do all these metaphors and all the symbolism and stuff and whatever you were reading. So what's Peter talking about? There's no substance to what they what they did. Okay, because when you see springs without water, okay, that means that the the source, the water, okay, is not there. Okay, same thing with mist from a storm. <clears throat> Blackest darkness. Okay, there's nothing there. Yeah. The uh, <clears throat> some translations will actually say wells without water that they have come up dry. You put the bucket down in the well and you come back up and there's no water in it. It's useless. The thing about that though is wells um, they will go dry sometimes, and you wait for a storm to come through, fill that well back up. The, the translation of it is better, springs without water. Is, what, what is a spring? How's a spring different from a well? It's supposed to move. It moves from where? The mountain from underneath. Yeah, from underneath. It's, it comes up from the ground. It doesn't rely on groundwater going down into it. And so the imagery that he uses here, these are individuals that their words to you are about as useless as a spring that has run out of water. There's no water coming out of it anymore. And so there's just nothing there that will help you out. And, and the words that he uses here are pretty significant, aren't they? Because what did Jesus say about his words? They, they, they were a living water. They were a spring that wells up within a person. That, that the words of Jesus never run out of their usefulness and their power and their, their ability to, to, to refresh us and to give us strength. Um, it's significant because God has put within us this thirst for his words and, and thirst for knowledge, thirst for truth, thirst for what the Spirit has to teach us. And what he says is these individuals who are trying to tear you down, trying to lead you away, they don't have anything to offer you to fill your thirst. You got to go to the source. You got to go to the, the true living water that Jesus said would well up within us. The mists with the, that are driven by a storm. Um, we kind of know a little bit about that. Not, not so much... Uh, not, not so much the mist all the time, but we know about uh, things being driven by wind, don't we? You see things, you know, kind of being blown here and there and just making a, a lot of a mess. Well, what he's talking about here, and some translations will actually kind of put it this way, what he's thinking of is this cloud, a mist. And that cloud is really useless too because whenever you, whenever we see a cloud come up, what do we hope we have in it? Rain. rain, that's right. And this is a cloud that comes up and it has no rain in it. It's being blown around. It's, been, it's kind of going here and there. But as David said, there's no substance to it. There is no usefulness in it. There's nothing that will bring benefit to a person's life. And that's what it says. You got to be careful of these guys because they're, giving you words that won't help you out of it. And then he finally just says it right out. He says, they mouth empty, boastful words. A bunch of words that won't help anybody a, a bit. And the reason why they're useless and they're boastful, he says, they, uh, they appeal to the lustful desires of the flesh. They entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. In other words, they are those that they, instead of appealing and trying to grow the spirit within a person, they're appealing to people's selfish desires. We never have to draw trouble with that, do we? <laughs> Most people would say, anytime you hear a politician speak, that's who the kind of person Peter's talking about. 
Here, I'll give you this. Here, I'll give you that. Vote for me. I'll give you this. Go for me. I'll give you that. And it's always the gimme, 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 gimme. And I'll give you this. And I promise to do that. I promise to do this. And they'll always have their big list of things that they promise that they'll do for you. And then they get elected. And then nothing happens. It was empty, boastful words. And he says, these teachers are like that. They promise lots of stuff. Because they're promising to give you stuff that you have this selfish desire for. And then it never, it's kind of like springs without water. It's like a mist driven by the wind. It just, there's nothing to it. You come up empty. But notice the ones they prey on. He says they prey on those who are just escaping from those who live in error. Who are those individuals? I take it as uh, uh, recent converts okay, <coughs> that were taught the word but don't have any don't have any spiritual depth yet. And these these guys, these false guys, are coming and and pulling them back into their previous lifestyle. Yeah. They find those individuals that are not, that their roots don't go down very deep. And like you said, it's oftentimes because they haven't had time to go down deep. But you know, it was, um, how, how old does a person have to be to be spiritually mature? <laughs> 25. 25. <laughs> I, could, I, could, I still feel spiritually immature sometimes. Yeah. But as I as I delve deeper into the Bible, I feel more understanding. Yeah. As I seek that for myself. I don't I don't think it's good to listen to nobody really. I think it's good to listen to somebody if they're if the word of God is the first thing that they're talking about and what the word of God can do for you and not what the individual person can do for you. So, yeah. You match their words up with what God says. Yeah. And if they're speaking for God, you know that because you see truth. If, if they're not speaking God's words, you know there's something else going on here. Mm -hmm. But you're right. There's individuals that are fairly spiritually mature at 25. There are those that are pretty spiritually mature at 65. How old? How old is a person who, how do I ask this question? When does a person, at what age does a person stop being spiritually immature? That we can we can never know enough. We can never know everything about God. No, and, and actually. Paul says in, in uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 4, that the person who understands they don't know it all actually shows some maturity. <laughs> you know, they actually say, yeah, I haven't arrived yet. I'm still growing. I'm still trying to get there. And he says, people who are mature are going to think that way. See, it's, it's kind of a trick question, isn't it? Because spiritual maturity does not depend on chronological <clears throat> age. <clears throat> Spiritual maturity depends on how well a person gets into God's word and gets into truth and takes it in themselves and relies on the spirit to work in their lives. You see, these individuals, they're, they're preying on those guys and the gals that are not mature in their faith. And yeah, a lot of those would be new converts, new Christians, who haven't had a chance to build up their faith yet. But some of these may be folks that have been practicing Christians for years, but they still haven't gone down deep, have they? I mean, we know of folks like that. Maybe I've been one of those at some point. And then there have been times in my life I think maybe I have been. I could be a Christian for 30 years, and yet because I haven't gotten down deep into God's word, I'm still right there on the surface. Jesus told a parable about that, didn't he? The word of God falling on different types of ground. And just depending on how that person's heart is will depend on how down deep those roots can go. 
So some people will listen to a false teacher and they may have been a part of a church for 20, 30, 40 years. The, the, the warning here, Peter is, is warning these disciples, warning these believers, watch who you're listening to. It's kind of like what you just said, Kandra. It's, it's watch who you're listening to. Are they speaking God's words or are they making them up on their own? Are they speaking of God's freedom through his promises or are they trying to entice you to promises that they can't keep because it's no freedom at all? And the big warning to them is this, blackest darkness is reserved for them. I don't know about you, that's, that's, that's really uh, scary. It is kind of scary. <laughs> and I, I don't want to be a part of that, so mm -hmm. I'm just going to pick up and pick up that word of God and keep diving on up in that and keep asking the good old Holy Spirit to just keep on coming up in you, girl. And we're going to be just right. We don't have to see that kind of dark darkness. No. That, that dark darkness would be the place where God is not. Because God, God is, is light. light. Mm -hmm. So that would be forever torture. And, and that is probably what he's talking about there. It's, it's not so much the level of punishment that these folks are headed for as much as the quality that he's talking about. It is blackest darkness. It is as far away from God's light as you can possibly get. My version says the darkest part of hell is waiting for them. Yeah. It's strong. It is strong, isn't it? And, and it's because they have turned their back on God. They have turned away from his light to the point that they don't have anything to do with it. They have created their own light, which was no light at all. He'll have some other ominous things to say about them here in just a little bit. Let's, let's get to those. So he, he talks about their false freedom. Then he talks about that um, these promises are being offered by enslaved people. Notice verse 19 again. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they've escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ or again entangled in it and overcome, they're worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. Peter says a person cannot lead somebody to freedom if he or she is still in bondage. Let's let that one sink in a little bit. A person cannot lead somebody to freedom if they're still in bondage. What were these individuals, these false teachers, what were they enslaved to? The flesh, I would think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what he keeps talking about in 2 Peter. They, they keep giving themselves to flesh desires. It's what Paul talked about in Romans 6, where he says everybody's going to be serving a master. You're either going to serve sin or you're going to serve the Lord. And the one who has been set free from serving sin can now serve God. They can now serve the Lord, which is where freedom is found. But if you keep going back to that sin, you become entangled in it. I mean, go back to the beginning of chapter 2 here. Look at some of the things that he said about them. Chapter 2, verse 3. He says, In their greed... These teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnations long hanging has long been hanging over them. Their distract, destruction has not been sleeping. And then he says in verse 14, with eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. One of the things he says about these guys is that they have given themselves over to greed and because of that greed, uh, well, they keep wanting more. Their desire for things just led to wanting more things. I mean, that is the real problem that we've got in our country, isn't it? This, this desire to have more, desire to have more. And just about the time that you ought to have enough, you just want so much more. 
And that's what he's, he's talking about these guys. Their greed has led them to the point where they have desired so much that they just keep wanting more. And they're slaves to it. Go to verse 10. He said, this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they're not afraid to keep abuse on celestial beings. And verse 14 talks about them again, being eyes full of adultery. They never stop sinning. These are individuals that they just, they feed their lust and in feeding that lust and that selfishness, they just hunger for more. They can't get enough of it. It's the individual who uh, they, they, they want uh, that they, they find their excitement and thrills over some dangerous activity of some kind. And, and you know, once you conquer that, what's you know, do you finally just kind of sit back and say, Whoo! Well, that was good, and now I don't have to do it anymore. No, most of the time they say, Okay, what's next? Okay, I've, I've gone this far. What can I do beyond that? Remember, evil can evil. How many of you are old enough? This side of the room is old enough for evil can evil. Is this side of the room old enough yet? I've heard of evil can evil. Was he like a boat, a, a, a motorcycle dude? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, see? There you go. Yeah. He jumped over like the Grand Canyon and stuff. Yeah, it, yeah Snake right. River Canyon. <laughs> but oh, that was, Grand Canyon. That was that at the end good. of his career. Yeah. He started out, you know, oh, a couple of cars. And then that wasn't enough. Now you got to do a couple of buses. And that wasn't enough. Now you got to do 12 buses. <laughs> and that wasn't enough. Now you got to do 15 buses. And that wasn't enough. Now you got to go through hoops of fire. And that wasn't enough. Now you got to go across an entire canyon. I hope that canyon wasn't his end. It wasn't his end, but he didn't quite make it. Mm -hmm. he, he, uh, he had a parachute on his, was it on his bike or was it on this person, I can't remember now. Mm -hmm. I remember watching it on TV. I was just, I was just this big. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's that idea. I've done this. Now I gotta do this. Now I gotta do this. And that's what these guys are like. They can't offer freedom because they just have this hunger and this thirst, this addiction for more. And we can't have more stuff like that. Because that's stuff of this world. That's right. And you're enslaved by it. You're, you're enslaved by the prince of this world. And then notice, um, let's read verses 10 through 12 again. Again, this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desires of the flesh, despise authority, bold and arrogant. They're not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they're stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they don't understand. They're like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. In their pride, they continue to promote it and they continue to go into deeper in that fleshly desire because their bold and their arrogance shows no uh, salt. It's interesting to me that in verse 19, it used in my version, it uses the word freedom, but it also uses the word slaves. Mm. Okay, and those are two totally opposites. Okay, it says they promised them, okay, these people that they're trying to seduce freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. Okay, freedom, slavery. Yeah. And they try to mask that freedom or that slavery as the way to be truly free. 13 messes with me when it says. They've done evil and will be rewarded with evil. Mm. Makes me think that their, their troubles and stuff that they're going through are not only going to be in the darkest places in hell, but here on earth while they're living as well, because they know they're in the wrong. Mm -hmm. They're harming themselves and they're harming everybody around them. And, and I wonder, did they even know that? Did they even know the harm they were causing to themselves? Or did they care? Yeah. They might not have cared. See, I think it's possible that these guys actually thought they had freedom. 
Turn Paul in over to Romans chapter 12 because Paul says at the beginning of the chapter, he says, Hey, we have grace. He spent the first five chapters of Romans talking about grace. And he says, Because we have grace, there are some folks out there saying, Well, because I'm saved by grace, shouldn't I just keep on sinning so that I can keep getting more grace? <clears throat> and of course, Paul's answer to that is by no means. But I get, the, I get the impression that maybe these guys actually thought they were free because they felt free to do anything they wanted to. Kind of like what JJ said. I can clean up the house, not clean up the house. I can do cartwheels in the house. And nobody's going to say anything because I'm free. And they have fooled themselves into thinking that because of God's grace, that just means I can do anything I want to. God's going to take care of it. God's going to He's gonna. He's there to serve me. You see how we sometimes fool even ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reality set in for me when I had to clean all day. <laughs> oh, my, oh man! It always comes back to get you, doesn't it? Yeah, that whole house that's yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody else there to help you clean it. Yeah. There, there's a warning here for us. I mean, <clears throat> do I sometimes allow myself to desire things so much that it just feeds my desire to want more and want more? What I find myself in doing is then I'm not free. I, I don't know about you. Every once in a while, you know, we go through our house and we'll have garage sale. And you know how free garage sales are? At least Angela keeps telling me that. That's my wife. She says, yeah, we finally got rid of some stuff. We don't have as much stuff. And then what do we do? Get more stuff. Get more stuff. In fact, usually we go to somebody else's garage sale and get their stuff. <laughs> and we've learned, you know, kind of in the, a hard way, just like most of us do, that... <laughs> There is no freedom in getting more and more stuff. And yet, I keep falling for that lie. If I just had this, if I just had that, if I just had this, then I'd be free. Or, um, if I just had this experience, if I just had this, if I just gave myself to this, it's not going to hurt, just, just a little bit. This substance, this activity, this uh, thrill, whatever it is, if I just do a little bit of it, then I'll finally be free because I finally was able to experience the good things in life. And it just, it's just something that opens up that desire to have more and to have more and to have more. And I'm just, I'm enslaved to that need to have more and more and more. Or I fall for the lie that uh, life is all about me. And I just fill my pride with building myself up instead of building Jesus up. And sometimes we can do that all for the sake of religion. You know, if God would just give me more money, then I can really serve him. You know what? If God would just let me enjoy more of this life, then I could share that with others. Doesn't God know how good I am? But then, then reality hits. Notice verse, uh, verse 20. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit. And a sow that is washed returns to her wallow in the mud. Yeah. <laughs> this, this was kind of funny this last week. Is, um, 
our daughter, our youngest daughter has a new puppy. Actually, she's had the puppy for a few months now, but she's trying to train this puppy. And, and one, one of the things that happened the other day was the, the puppy uh, uh, threw up, vomited on the floor. And before she could clean it up, Ooh, really? <laughs> he licked it all back up. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's biblical. <laughs> what did this verse for? And it turns our stomach even to think about it, doesn't it? Sorry, JJ, you're, you're kind of in bad shape anyway, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. But she said, that's, that's what he's talking about, these folks. And notice some of the truth he says here. Because what's happening is, remember... They're going to receive harm for the harm they've done. They're going to find their reward in the, the harm that they've done. Well, they're starting to find it because what they're offering is a false hope. See, one of the things he says about them, it is possible to return to bondage after tasting the gift of freedom. It is possible to know the freedom that we have in Christ and give it up and go back to slavery. In the world. Is that not frightening or not? It is pretty frightening. And I don't want to be worse off. Yeah. See, that's that's the part of it that is, is kind of hard to, to, uh, to, to really digest. Is that it is a worse condition than you had before. It is possible... To give up and return to bondage and taste and to get the freedom. Well, how did they do that? Um, verse 20. They had rejected true freedom offered to Jesus Christ and chosen to return to that slavery of sin. It's possible to do. Verse 21. They had rejected God's commands of true holiness. Verse 22. Uh, they had rejected the pure way of the spirit and they preferred instead those that defiled way of the flesh. I've got a question. How is it possible to be in a worse condition after all that than before you came to Christ? Because you knew that you know better. And so that means what? Like, you know about it, so, like, you're just going up against it. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like, see, my, again, that same daughter, she is a, she's a nurse. And I sometimes wonder how if she has to clean up bodily fluids all the time. How do you do that and not get sick to your stomach over it? Well, some people, I guess, are kind of born that way. They just don't have the same kind of problem with it. Others of us, you kind of get desensitized, don't you? You know, after you do it enough, it just doesn't bother you anymore. And maybe that's one of the ways that they're worse off. They were really convicted of their condition without Christ when they first came to Christ. As they started slipping back into those ways of the world, they lost that sensitivity to Christ. It is so hard to regain that sensitivity. They're worse off than they were at the beginning. Can you think of another way that they would have been worse off? Well, verse 21 is is uh, is really strong. Uh, Peter says it would have been better if they wouldn't even have accepted the word mm -hmm. than accept it and then allow the, the world to bring them back in. Okay? It's better just not even to know. That's that's pretty powerful. Okay, because both Peter and God want all of us to be saved. Yeah, he's saying here it's better uh, if if you didn't even do it. That's right. Go over to Luke chapter 12. Hold your place there. Because Jesus tells a short little parable in Luke chapter 12. 
that may give us another indication of how a person is worse off by going back. Luke chapter 12. Um, We find the verses here. Luke 12, verses, I didn't go far enough down. Verse 42. Let's, let's go down to verse 47. Now, as the servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. Okay, so get, get the picture there. He says, this individual knows what the master wants and he rebels against him. He says, I'm not going to do it. And he says, he's going to be bit, beaten with many blows because of his rebellious spirit. Verse 48, but the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And, but, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Now, Jesus doesn't go into details about what this will look like, what this means exactly. But what he does say is there is a truth about judgment and a truth about punishment that says the person who knows what they ought to do and they turn their back on it, there is a judgment and a punishment for them that is greater than the individual who is oblivious to it, who is ignorant of it, and yet is guilty. It's, it's the same, you know, in, in our own court system, it's the same difference between, hey, I didn't know the law, and I'm sorry I trespassed on it. You're still guilty of breaking the law, but I just didn't know that I was supposed to do this. I didn't know I was supposed to pay this much more in taxes. I really didn't know it. And so there's going to be a little bit more lenience on it. There's still many consequences, but it's going to be a little bit more lenient. As opposed to the individual who says, yeah, I knew what the tax law was, and I chose not to pay it. Well, they're going to come after that guy. There's something in God's judgment that says, hey, the one that doesn't know and yet is guilty, there's a different kind of punishment and judgment on that individual then the one who knew it can turn their back on it. Again, Jesus doesn't go into details about what that means. Peter doesn't go into great detail about what that means. But I can tell you one area that it may mean, you know, whenever we leave this life and we go into the next, Scripture is fairly clear that we don't lose our memories. We still know. I mean, remember the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? And uh, the rich man says, please go back and tell my brothers, you know, that they're going the wrong way. I don't want them to end up the same way I have. And so he hadn't forgot about his life on earth. I wonder if part of it is that once a person turns away from God and then they wind up in hell because of it, if those memories plague them. If I'd only done this, if I'd only stayed true to Christ, if I'd only, the whole time that they're suffering judgment because of their rebellion against God. And the worst thing about that is there's not anything they can do at that point. No. It's a, it's, it's past. The, the chances are gone. And that, and they got to live with that for eternity. And that's a long memory. Yeah. Now, before we leave this class, just everybody completely depressed and frightened. <laughs> Let's ask the other side of the question then. So how do we protect ourselves from those false promises? How do we protect ourselves from that false hope? Those empty promises that some people are trying to give us. Have a spirit of discernment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you said earlier, make sure you're listening to truth. Make sure you're listening to that true source for freedom. What did Jesus say? Where, did, where is freedom found, according to Jesus? He says it in Romans 8, two different ways. I think it's around Romans 8, 32. He says, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then I think it's verse 36. He says, I'm the truth, and I set you free. 
So if you want freedom, know Jesus Christ and know him as truth. You see, the purpose of this, Peter isn't trying to make people question and be afraid that uh, they're going to be lost. No, he's talking to Christians and trying to help them protect themselves from being drawn away from those false promises. That's the way he starts out his letter. He says, I know you already know these things. I know that you know them. I'm just going to keep reminding you. I'm going to keep bringing them to your mind. I'm going to make sure that you keep them in your mind so that you don't follow that. So you don't get enticed. You don't get drawn away. Because you know it. Get close to the source. The other thing these false teachers have done is they were saying, you know, if you really want fulfillment in your life, here, we'll give you fulfillment. It's found in stuff. It's found in, in experiences. It's found in in filling up yourself. It's, it's found in those selfish desires that you have. And in that, boy, isn't that a buzzword for our world today? Everybody's looking to be fulfilled. But you see, we also need to look to the true source of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. um, it is that source of living water that comes up within us that fulfills us, that, that satisfies that thirst, that satisfies that hunger, that fulfills us. Love what um, his name is, P.T. Forsyth. He said, there can be no freedom or fulfillment apart from submission to Jesus Christ. When we talk about freedom, what scripture says is you're going to be a slave to somebody. You can be a slave to the world. And that's true slavery. Or you can be a servant of Jesus Christ, what Paul said, a slave of Jesus Christ, and then that you'll find freedom. But he says, the purpose of life is not to find your freedom. That is not the goal. It is not the goal of life to find how can I be free. The goal is to find your master. Then you find freedom. So, Take Peter's words for what he intends them to be, and that is a warning about staying close to God, staying close to Jesus Christ, staying close to his truth. Not to allow it to be unsettling to the point of, you know, causing me to wonder, am I saved, am I not saved, you know, am I okay? It's not to take away our freedom. It's actually to help us protect the freedom that we have found in Jesus Christ.